Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Know Before You Go. It is a broadcast briefing powered by J JSA and Telegeography. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okutaya, CEO and founder of JSA. And what is Know Before You Go? It is your show that covers everything attendees need to know, have on their radar from insider talking points to conference logistics, everything in between before attending that next big industry event. And yeah, talking big industry event, we have uh, today's focus on none other than Data Cloud Global Congress 2024. You can see we also have that QR code right over my shoulder. So go ahead and register at any time during this broadcast. And here to talk us through these conversations of what attendees can expect in and around Data Cloud Global Congress, we're excited to be joined by none other than Telegeography's Senior Research Manager, John Yembo and Nautilus Data Technologies, Vice President of Marketing, the fabulous Ashley Sturm. Welcome, for, guys. Thank you. Thanks for thank having you. me. Thank you. All right, let's just get right to it with industry trends. Kicking it off with the trends to know before you go to Data Cloud Global Congress, let's start by talking about the hot up and coming markets for new data center development. All right, John, I'm going to bring you in first here to get the analyst insights. What are your thoughts? There's a lot to wrap our heads around. There's always a lot going on. And uh, this, I mean, this time period is incredibly busy in the industry. Um, I, by our estimates, there are at least 300 commercial data centers in the immediate pipeline globally. Uh, about 35% of those are in the APAC region, but it's really, really global. Um, if I was to point out just a couple of markets that I think are of particular interest right now, um, I, I guess I would start with India. Um, you know, it's long been a really critical market on the sub for sub C, um, Mumbai and Chennai. But the development in India right now is absolutely nationwide. So you have all these local and uh, joint venture companies just um, with an explosion of growth across India. Um, moving down to Southeast Asia. Um, you know, Singapore has long been the, the most critical hub there, and it remains so. But with the new licensing regime in place and kind of this indefinite sort of slow drip of new capacity going into Singapore, um, it's created a lot of opportunity elsewhere in Southeast Asia. And I think we're seeing that particularly in Malaysia and Indonesia. So, um, you know, we've been talking about it for a couple of years, but it's really happening now with uh, international players from China, Japan, Singapore, the U.S. everywhere coming in to to the to that part of the world right now. Um, what's what's interesting too is going up to North Asia. Um, uh, we've been talking about South Korea for some time. There are challenges with getting backhaul access there, um, and it's it's been a little bit difficult to get started. But um, things are really starting in South Korea as well, and I think it's also partly a result of some of the constraints happening in Singapore and also the geopolitical concerns with Hong Kong. Everyone's realizing we need to distribute our um, connectivity on a much wider um, scale. So, uh, so South Korea is starting to see some serious international investment. And then Japan too. I mean, this is one of the, the core global markets has been forever. But um, it's it's traditionally been a little bit more insular, slower growing. But it's there's kind of a new wave of development happening in Japan right now with some international players moving in for the first time even. Um, and then um, I guess one other I would mention going across to Europe would be Germany, another you know key global market. Um, it's like several other key markets. It has undergone some real. Um, uh, hiccups lately uh, as a result of concerns over power and sustainability, regulatory concerns. But despite that, there's still like a there's still a really strong pipeline uh, ready to go into the Frankfurt region and now also increasingly into Berlin. So those are a couple of the ones I would mention. Very interesting. And Ashley, from a technology perspective, John mentions, uh, oh my goodness, uh, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Korea. Germany, some some interesting uh, names there. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. One that I would add and more on a micro perspective and near to data cloud, uh, Marseille. It's an up and coming data center market, particularly notable within the European context. So its strategic location as a gateway between Europe, Africa and Asia makes it a critical hub. 
for international connectivity. Now the city, as we know, the host several submarine cable landing stations, and those are going to provide direct and high capacity links to various regions across the globe. But of course, you got the typical strongholds that are growing because everywhere is growing and expanding. But I think it'll be the most interesting are the unseen markets that are now going to become available because of how AI is shifting the way we think about site selection for data center infrastructure. I know you couldn't have transitioned to our next question more beautifully. So thank you, Ashley. Um, and my question really is, uh, is AI more likely to drive us into these new markets or increase build outs in hub locations? John, I'll start with you. Yeah, so this is very much a rapidly evolving situation. Um, you know, it's over the last year, year and a half, um, the, the industry has scrambled to try to understand uh, how we need to pos position ourselves going forward with um, with this this commercial acceleration of generative AI applications. Um, so, in answer to that question, the, the the general answer is that you know if you have you have training applications and inference applications, training is not as latency sensitive, so it provides opportunity to deploy more resources on a on a more remote. Um, uh, positioning. So that, that gives you the opportunity to, to find places with more abundant and cheaper power. So that will definitely create some opportunities in markets that um, may not be um, overly developed yet. However, uh, when it comes to inference, it's unfortunately going to cause more constraint in markets that are already really constrained because you have to be where the end users are. But those general um, presumptions uh, aside, there's a, a lot more and how it ultimately pans out, right? So uh, in some cases, you'll have, I mean, you have to reach edge markets too. So that'll actually be an opportunity for inference deployments as well. Um, in some cases, data sovereignty laws will come into play. So you will have to deploy somewhere that you might not otherwise because of regulatory restrictions. Um, and then in some cases, um, you're going to have to go wherever your um, AI cluster resources are. Um, and uh, that may take you to places that you might not otherwise choose first. Um, so it's going to be a mad scramble. And ultimately, I think it'll be a both and development further afield. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Ashley, what do you think? Yeah, so agreed, John. It's um, it's such an interesting time. So for instance, like you mentioned, the new metadata centers, they're going into Alabama. That's huge. And for that state, Alabama Power, even before this, created a website showcasing those sites with hundreds of megawatts of available power, 99.0% uptime, tons of affordable acreage. And now, because of AI, those sites are going to be truly viable. Now, not all this, we've got a similar site available in Maine, 100% hydropower, fiber already there. I think you'll see the spread go to some of these locations like Utah, Nebraska, that we've not even heard of before because of what AI enables. And Ashley, staying here with you for a sec, um, how drastically do data centers need to really be redesigned to support AI? Yeah, so supporting AI workloads necessitates a substantial redesign of traditional data center architectures. I think the doubling of the average reported rack density from uptime jumping to 12 kilowatts has made it obvious that data centers are moving in this direction. Um, and now the critical differentiator will be how quickly can they get there? AI workloads require enhanced power density, um, advanced cooling solutions to manage the heat produced by high performance computing systems. Um, at Nautilus, for instance, we utilize innovative water cooling technologies. They significantly improve uh, thermal management and energy efficiency, but additionally, the infrastructure, it must be agile. So you, we have to allow for quick scalability, flexibility to integrate new technologies, and then accommodate varying power and cooling needs. So it's not just about scaling up, it's about smarter, more efficient designs that align with the computational and environmental demands of AI. Yeah, wow, you just blew my mind. Um, John, going, going to you with the same question, data centers redesigned yeah. to support AI, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Ashley's saying for sure. Um, and we already see some of that. You know, we see yeah. like Meta was a great early example where they kind of halted their entire global development um, as they've tried to figure out what on earth do we do going forward with this AI stuff. So that was an early example, and we'll see a lot more of that. Um, in the interim, too, though, I think um, 
as we're trying to sort this all out, operators are trying to figure out how to utilize what they have at their disposal now. Um, and so the the early the early term solution seems to be gravitating towards hybrid air and liquid cooling, direct to chip liquid cooling, and you know using the same support infrastructure, similar rack configurations, probably moving things around a little bit to accommodate the density levels. Um, but but the, the big challenge, of course, being deploying uh, liquid cooling at scale. But ultimately, yeah, I mean, you know, we're going to have to rethink a lot of things. You know, if you're using full immersion liquid cooling, that changes your floor loading. It changes um, the, the PDU support levels that you need and so forth. There's a lot that will need to be changed. But um, there's also, I mean, th th there are also still so many unknowns in it, just because we don't know ultimately what this is going to look like. Um, you know, when we look at the AI chip development um, right now, it's like this, the, the brute force model has kind of come to the forefront. And as that scales up, there's more and more power demanded. And that changes what we can, what, you know, that, 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 that hits our limitations of what we can support in the data center. But, you know, then you have these scrappy up and coming companies that are trying to, um, to proffer these ideas about um, uh, reference framing and other ideas for how to uh, do things more efficiently so that AI can use less power relative to what we're doing now. So, you know, depending how that pans out, um, that, that could change the degree to which we change overall architecture. So it'll be exciting to see how that how, what, what happens. Well said, well said. And as Ashley even mentioned uh, just a little earlier, the race to 12 kilowatts, does the data center market have access even to this power needed to support AI requirements? How are we as data center providers solving this problem of power scarcity, John? Uh, so the answer to the first question, unfortunately, is uh, no. <laughs> we, we're not. We don't have access to enough power. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, this is not a new problem. Um, going back to at least 2019, we had these high profile examples, starting with Singapore and Frankfurt and, you know, several other markets ending up with the, you know, even the biggest data center market in the world, Northern Virginia. Um, we're all struggling. And uh, and it's not just these high profile markets. It's absolutely everywhere. We're hearing about or try to secure the power needed. Um, so it's it's a rough time. And then on top of that, um, we have. Um, uh, we, we, now that we have the AI applications, um, um, adding adding fuel to the flames, um, so to speak. So it's it's really challenging. Um, as far as how operators are addressing it, um, you know, unfortunately, it's going to be expensive and it's going to require data center operators to increasingly move into an area that's not their core competency. You know, moving into uh, proactively moving into utility provisioning in some level, and that's that's challenging. Um, but you know, the industry is absolutely stepping up. We're seeing it already on, on varying levels. You know, there's everything from partnering with green energy providers to try to deploy data centers closer to locations that you can quickly access power without having to rely on insufficient transmission lines, for example. Um, so, you know, the high profile examples recently, uh, AWS buying the nuclear power data center in um, uh, Pennsylvania recently. Um, they also just moved into Louisa County recently, which, where they had access to nuclear power there as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we see Digital Realty partnering with um, green power providers in Europe. Um, but uh, it's going to be it's going to be a mad dash, both for unfortunately for fossil fuel and for clean power, because, you know, there's just not enough to go around um, there. It's it's driving operators to um, look more towards solutions that are kind of on the verge of commercial viability, too, which is exciting. Um, you know, nuclear fission and so forth, small modular reactors. Um, you know, Equinix is partnering, I think, with Okla. Um, and uh, they're they're trying to secure power to um, from from that technology for for some data center builds, and then you even have some operators deciding you know we're just going to have to build out our own uh, power generation. So it's an exciting time. Um, it's a it's a difficult time, but it's it's really interesting to see how the operators are stepping up to meet the challenge. Yeah. Ashley, um, uh, do you agree? Is uh, uh, necessity breeding more in innovation here? How are we providing, uh, how are we solving for power scarcity? 
Yeah, no, certainly. I think John killed it. And I have nothing to add. I mean, I think, you know, when we really begin to explore that, he's right on site, whether that's hydro, as I mentioned before, with Alabama, and that's how they're touting it, or some type of on site generation and really coordinating with the local government, I think is going to be necessary to move forward. It's, a, it's another good lead in that I want to talk to you about, Ashley. When we shift from AI, it's also, uh, you know, it, it does marry the uh, other big topic of our industry, sustainability. What do you think will be the biggest sustainability related topics to st- discussed um, at Data Cloud Global Congress uh, soon and why? Yeah, so this, this I feel is a big one because sustainability in data centers is transitioning from an optional feature to really a core requirement. But I think it's driven by the mainstream public's growing awareness of the environmental impacts associated with digital infrastructure. So I think major topics of discussion are now going to include the integration, of course, of renewable energy resources and the adoption of energy efficient cooling technologies to reduce the overall carbon footprints. But there's also an increasing emphasis on minimizing the use of physical materials, so such as copper, aluminum and data center construction, um, which really begins to align with efforts to reduce scope two and scope three emissions associated with purchased electricity and the embodied carbon of building materials. But as public awareness grows, I think it's a big factor. Um, There's a corresponding increase in scrutiny and then, of course, potential social outcry, which can lead to then more stringent government oversight and regulation. And then this heightened awareness and then the potential for regulatory response really underscores the importance of proactive sustainability practices in data centers. So by addressing these challenges effectively, the industry can hopefully mitigate the risk associated with public and governmental pressure and then continue to thrive in an increasingly eco-conscious marketplace. I uh, couldn't have said it better. Uh, wonderfully said, of, for, by the industry. It's important that we uh, define our own rules before government regulations step in. All right. One last big question, guys, uh, before I let you go. Um, how are we doing at addressing gaps in our digital infrastructure development around the world? John? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, a there's always more to be done, um, but my gosh, we've we've come a long way too. Mm-hmm. Um, the the industry, I mean, you know, long gone are the days when you have to uh, get all your traffic up to some major regional hub to to get your peering and transit, and then trombone it back down to the end destination. We have a far more robust, intermeshed, edge driven digital infrastructure now, and um, we're reaching more and more end users. So it's good to see that. And I mean, we're, we're really on the cusp of a lot of um, edge market development and yeah, deeper market development within regions and subregions. The international operators are taking a more proactive interest in um, Nigeria and Kenya. Um, uh, Latin America has been really interesting too. Um, you know, traditionally that was one of those classic trombone traffic kind of markets goes from Brazil up to Miami and back down. Um, but now with Chile, Colombia, Mexico, I, I mean, there's so much happening. Um, and this is everything, not just data centers. It's it's all interlinked. The data center, the the, the peering infrastructure, cloud and, and network infrastructure. And, you know, we see it on the subsea side too. New routes, new, new, uh, new landing nodes, um, creating lots of opportunity for for further development. So it's it's very encouraging. Yeah, I love that answer, Ashley. Uh, anything further to add with addressing gaps in our infrastructure development around the world? Yeah, agreed. So while progress, of course, is being made. Uh, significant gaps still remain, especially in underserved regions. The main challenges include, of course, lack of funding. Regulatory hurdles is still a big one and an inadequate local expertise. So partnerships between governments, industry, and international bodies are really vital to bridge these gaps. Investment in local workforce development and technology transfer also really plays a crucial role. But we will continue, we must continue to innovate in how we design, build, and operate data centers to make them more accessible and efficient across these diverse geographies. Um, Amazing. Ashley, John, your insights, incredible. I feel much more prepared getting my ticket and and boarding up for Data Cloud Global Congress. Thank you so much for your incredible uh, thoughts and responses here. Let's go ahead and finish out this briefing with some insider tips for making the most of our time over at Data Cloud Global Congress. (music) 
And to get those insider tips for our fabulous big event coming up, I'm joined by Paige Reeves, product manager for Broad Group, one of the lead organizers, of course, of Data Cloud Global Congress, to share some tips on how attendees can really make the most of their time over in Cannes. Welcome, Paige. Thank you for being here, especially during these very critical last few weeks leading up to your show. Thanks very much for having me. It's nice to be here. Uh, we are so honored. So, by the way, let's start with the biggest news, the big headliner, Data Cloud Global Congress taking place in the fabulous new location, new city. Talk French Riviera to me. Tell us more about Cannes, the venue, and what this new location means for this year's conference. Yeah, so we're so excited to be hosting our event um, at the Palais de Festival in Cannes. So I think that's probably uh, best well known for being the venue for the Cannes Film Festival. Um, so if if you're attending, make sure you leave time to kind of walk around the venue because you'll see the famous handprints in the concrete um, and it's a, it's a nice spot and take a photo with it. Um, obviously Cannes is a great location, uh, but apart from that, for us more specifically, um, it gives us more space. Um, so we have more space for meeting rooms, um, for the, for our event content, and we have a larger exhibition. Um, so it's allowed our sponsors to build some really cool stands. Um, we have NTT hosting a bar on our terrace, Vertiv are bringing their cooling liquid tower. Um, we've got a Nordic pavilion, a Spanish pavilion, Host and Island are back with a larger pavilion, Gulf Data Association have got pavilion as well. Um, we have Siemens hosting our Speaker VIP lounge. Um, we've also got these beautiful cabanas outside. So um, when you're, you know, when you're having a break, you can walk out onto the terrace, um, join the cabana. Uh, we have lots of bars there. So it's a really nice networking area. Um, and then I guess the city itself, um, I think it's just a bit more accessible. So kind of better hotels, restaurants, bars um, for kind of socializing after the event, which um, I'm sure people will be very happy to hear. I'll tell you, um, and speaking on behalf of the data center industry, uh, you guys are just known for keeping us uh, one step ahead, raising that bar on, on the overall poshness of our industry. First Monaco, now can, like walk the red carpet. It's the film festival location. Come on. This is amazing. So exciting. Um, okay. So other than the city, what is new with the event? What difference this year that our audience should be watching out for? Yes, yeah, so um, I guess it's it's good to look at the the kind of conference format. Um, so we've got our keynote theatre, uh, which is the floor above the exhibition. But new for this year, we have our innovation theatre. So this is on the exhibition floor, um, and it will be a mix of panel discussions and also um, kind of short case study presentations. So it's a really nice opportunity for companies to kind of showcase really cool initiatives that they've done with their clients. Um, and then we also have a new debate style format. So this will be in our workshop room. And that's allowed us to kind of do a deep dive into, you know, some of those huge topics, um, sustainability and financing. So these sessions are an hour long um, and they're a bit more um, interactive. So it gives the audience a kind of chance to, re to really like participate in the discussion. Uh, and talking discussions, your education. Uh, again, uh, you, you set a new level. So from an education standpoint, what can we expect? I mean, can we even talk about a data center event without mentioning AI? I don't think so. So um, <laughs> we've got a really jam-packed agenda. I think I've got over 150 speakers across the two days. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, some of our biggest themes are AI, uh, power, cooling. Um, we're really excited to be joined by Noel Walsh, Corporate VP for Cloud and Operations and Innovation, um, to discuss how Microsoft sees the AI revolution developing. Uh, so she's our opening keynote on day one. Um, we've got um, other keynote sessions on kind of more general market overview for the next two years, um, looking at challenges such as staffing, supply chain, land, power, um, and crucially where the opportunities lay. Um, we've got a session on regulation, so looking at the CSRD reporting requirements and energy directives. Um, and we've also got some kind of regional spotlight sessions. So if you're interested in the Middle East, APAC, Africa, um, we've got specific sessions um, kind of looking at the growth in those regions. Incredible, incredible. And I feel, I feel like I, I need to say JSA, uh, we're very proud to sponsor one of Data Cloud's talent and tech mm -hmm. initiatives hosting a greener data panel discussion on sustainability and digital infrastructure. 
but uh, also very focused on teaching that younger talent, the next generation of our industry coming in. Uh, so that will be taking place on Thursday, June 6th, I should say. We're, we're going to uh, give one of our books away to every one of your uh, uh, talent and tech participants uh, that, are, that are there. And we're really excited about that. So can you tell us a little bit about this talent and tech initiative and where attendees can really join in into our greener data discussion? Yeah, so this is something that we're, we're really passionate about at Data Cloud. So we're, we're growing the initiative this year. Um, so our Talent and Tech initiative, um, it's headed up by Susanna Cass and Petra Tomaras and also Jessica Lang, who's part of our team at Data Cloud. Um, and it's essentially, it, it's, you know, it's a free to attend initiative. So we invite students and kind of anyone with under um, two years experience to come along and actually really see what an industry leading event is like. Um, you know, they get to sit in all the sessions, um, hopefully network with some people. Um, so this year we've got two sessions running. So on day one, we have our talent and tech networking lunch, um, and this is going to include a panel from Google, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. Yeah. And on day two, um, we have the JSA Greener Data Sustainable Panel, um, which is inspired by the Amazon best-selling uh, Greener Data book series. Um, so they're both going to be taking place at lunch in the keynote theater. Uh, we are so excited about that. Um, again, you know, tomorrow's problems um, and challenges needing to be uh, solved by uh, not not old ideas that we, you know we've done years ago, but new mm -hmm. fresh ideas. And so, um, being able to sit in and talk with uh, your talent and tech uh, attendees uh, is really critical to the movement of sustainability in our industry. So, thank you for that, uh, for making that happening. And and again, you know, not many conferences think the way you do. So it's it's very special. Um, okay, so we should talk networking too. What other networking events and opportunities should everyone have on their radar? So we have our welcome uh, reception on the 4th. Um, so this will take place on the outdoor terrace. So I think that's a great opportunity to take some selfies, um, say hi to people. That's definitely one not to miss. Um, we will have another drink reception at the end of day one. Um, and then we have happy hours running out in our exhibition hall. And also, as I mentioned before, we've got um, bars and the cabanas out on the terrace as well um, to really facilitate um, hopefully useful, but also beautiful networking opportunities for people. And we know that the stars come out, especially in the French Riviera, um, when it's Data Cloud Global Awards time, uh, as always a top highlight of your Congress. Uh, are there any award categories that maybe you're especially looking forward to? Yeah, so I think the awards is really exciting for this year. So um, it's we've kind of taken some feedback on board from previous years and we're actually designing a completely new awards program. Ooh. So it's going to be a lot more streamlined. Um, obviously, we want to celebrate everyone that has been shortlisted and that has won, but also where that, you know, we're in Cannes, we're going to bring some kind of Riviera glamour. We have um, Rebecca Leffler, who's our host. So she's a former French correspondent for The Hollywood Reporter um, and maybe more famous she's kind of the real life inspiration behind Emily in Paris so she's going to be hosting the awards um, and then when the awards are finished we'll be kind of throwing an after party so there'll be live music there'll be a dance floor there'll be lots of other activities uh, um, and hopefully we can all kind of celebrate um, the, the two days the awards and um, uh, for me I think categories wise I'm kind of personally um, really looking forward to the commitment to diversity and talent development award and also young talent of the year award oh I love those categories and I gotta say especially by having your uh, the real life inspiration behind Emily in Paris as as the host I can't wait to see this red carpet and what folks are wearing uh, it just seems like uh, again a uh, very posh glamour that you're bringing uh, to our industry which uh, you don't you don't equate the data cloud, uh, you know, uh, group with uh, passionists very often. So I love that. All right. So let me give you the question that I like to give all of our event organizers. What are your three top tips for us as we get ready for this year's conference? Okay, so I definitely say collect your badge on the fourth. So collect your badge on the fourth from four pm. Um, you'll be get to, you'll get to walk up the famous red carpet um, for registration, so you can kind of feel like George Clooney. Um, so yeah, badge collection is from four. Then we've got our welcome drinks reception from five. 
Um, and then uh, more generally, the event will open at 8.30 a.m. Um, and conference sessions will start at nine. Um, obviously, content is very close to my heart. So I would just say make sure that you get into the conference sessions nice and early um, and, uh, you know, hopefully enjoy some great networking with all the opportunities that we've provided. Uh, jam packed with quality content, your, your favorite, but also great networking. Uh, so exciting. Thank you so much, Paige, for joining us. And thank you also to Cello Geography Senior Research Manager, John Yembo and Nautilus Data Technologies, Ashley Sturm, for keeping us on point with some of this great insight on the latest trends that you will see at Data Cloud Global Congress. All right, and to get all the details, make sure you are ready for this year's Congress. Visit the URL right below, um, events.broad group.com slash data cloud global congress and when you're there make sure you're using that hashtag uh, data cloud global congress so by that you'll again get some great content and if you haven't registered yet i uh, welcome you to use that qr code right over my shoulder uh, make it a little easier to get to that events page but also use jsa discount code jsa10 to save on registration Tune in the week of Data Cloud Global Congress as JSA is very excited as part of uh, being our, our media partner to the fabulous um, Broad Group. Um, as JSA broadcasts live from the expo floor with JSA TV, interviews with top thought leaders. So be sure to stop by the Greener Data Panel session we mentioned Thursday, June 6th, part of talent and tech programming, which is again, uh, so critical uh, for this conference and for our industry education. In the meantime, follow both JSA and Telegeography on LinkedIn or find out more on jsa.net and telegeography.com. Thank you everyone for tuning in to Know Before You Go. See you in Cannes and as always, happy networking.